Hey, hey. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We have Laura Carvajal here with us from the Financial Times. If you want to find out what Pokemon, big media companies, and serverless have in common, uh, this is the session for you. So tell us, Laura, how it is for a software developer to work for a big media company. So far, we, we almost always had software developers working in software development companies, but I think you have a different perspective to offer today. Could be, yeah. So we have, when you look at the Financial Times, it's a, you'll see a picture of our building. It's like this black box. It seems like very corporate and that everyone would be wearing ties. So when I first interviewed, I was like, hmm, what's this going to be like? But the tech department is like a, also like a mid-sized startup within a media company. You don't feel like you're in this corporate world. Uh, although kind of the editorial side of things, maybe wearing ties and suits. Uh, we feel like in a world of our own there. So, uh, so yeah, people go to work wearing jeans and kind of like I am dressed now and it's pretty relaxed and nice. But yeah, you, it's, it's kind of surprising when you see that facade and then you find that in there. And you find the subculture inside. Yeah. What's that? And you find the subculture yeah, inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's completely right. different. Enjoy your <laughs> session and uh, of course the Q&A will be held on the HeapSpace booth after this talk. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. All right. So, um, see well, we get started there we go uh, has anyone here today ever collected football stickers or any kind of like baseball cars or anything okay uh, so I guess you'll be familiar with um, that feeling of, of needing to have to collect them all to have them all and how there was always that one player uh, or that one car that was nearly impossible to get um, I mean, nowadays you can go to eBay and buy the card that you're missing. So that, that thrill of finding the last one is kind of gone. But back in the 80s and 90s, um, you could search for months for the card that you were missing. And you would keep buying packets and packets and, and, and still not get the last card. Um, so now imagine that back then, if you were alive back then, but no, it's still imagine. Um, if you'd had some magical thing that told you where in your city, uh, in what streets, uh, in what kiosk, in what shelf, in what box, and in what packet, you could find the car that you were missing. That it, the thing that would just guide you to that car. Wouldn't that have been amazing? Uh, I remember actually dreaming of having something like this when I was a child. When I, was, I used to collect uh, uh, football cars and other kinds of cars a lot, and having that feeling of, of where in the world is this car that I'm missing? If I had a thing that could help me find it, that would be great. So um, today I'm going to tell you about how I built something similar, but for Pokemon Go last year. Um, and while I was doing that, I sort of learned the basics of, uh, of serverless, which I had used very little before. So what I built was something called a Pokemon Radar, uh, which knew out of hundreds of Pokemon uh, out there, the ones that I really wanted and alerted me uh, when one of them was near me without me having to open my app. Um, I'll, I'll go over kind of how I built that. Um, but before I get into that, um, I was just introduced. My name is Laura Carvajal. I'm a principal engineer at the Financial Times. That's the kind of black box I was talking about, but it's a lot more fun inside. Um, but the talk I'm going to give today is less about what I do in there um, and more about a side project. Uh, that's this kind of Pokemon radar. Uh, no, I work full time, I have two kids, and they're always the, last, the, the first to be dropped off and the last to be picked up. So side project is not something that I normally have a lot of time for, but um, this year, early this year, I, I was lucky enough to be able to indulge in one of them. Um, I wrote most of this during this time of day, so at, at dawn, it's kind of the most peaceful time around my house before anyone else has woken up and started needing things from me. Uh, so, but before I get into what I built, uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview of Pokemon Go. Has anyone here played Pokemon Go? Okay, that's about 10%. I'm going to assume 20%. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, I know you play. Um, so there are many aspects to this game, um, and different things drive different people to play it. I'm going to just focus on the one aspect of the game that's relevant for this talk, which is the uh, collecting aspect. You want to catch them all. That's kind of the catchphrase. Um, and much like football cards, like we just talked about, there are some Pokemon that are a lot more difficult to find than others. So they become kind of the rare ones, the, uh, the ones that you really, really want to catch. So kind of how does it work? Do you, you go out in the real world with a phone, open your app, and you catch them. So you're essentially in a map, and you walk around, and Pokemon just appear, and you catch them. If you walk around a lot, uh, you will, you know, and you have some luck, uh, you will eventually find them all. 
uh, and you also get very, very fit because there's a lot of walking involved. Alternatively, you could use a map, uh, kind of an unofficial map. I'll get into that in a bit. And then kind of find the ones that you're missing and just drive there, walk there, and get it. Um, so in, in this area is where it starts to get interesting from a software development perspective. So um, playing Pokemon Go, um, when you, while, while you're playing, there are some things that you see on your screen that happen on the client and others that happen on the Pokemon servers. Uh, so for example, throwing a ball to a Pokemon happens on, the, on your client, but the decision of whether or not that Pokemon is going to jump out of the ball or stay in the ball happens on the server. So there's a lot of uh, back and forth uh, communication with the server as you play. Um, so every few seconds, the client, or your phone, uh, the app, sends your location, a bunch of things, to the Pokemon servers, the Antic servers, uh, and it returns, among other things, the, uh, the Pokemon that are around, that are around you. So uh, the client communicates with the server using uh, Google protocol buffers. Um, and the reason we even know this is that in 2016, um, a group of developers reverse engineered the, the Android app um, and were able to kind of get to the code and essentially pose as a client themselves to be able to talk to the Pokemon servers uh, and be able to see kind of what these responses look like and what, what the responses were written in. Uh, so it's kind of a great window into this otherwise uh, closed system. Uh, it also allowed anyone being able to do this to kind of pose as, you know, to, to spoof their location, to pretend to be anywhere in the world, um, and then kind of get the Pokemon that were around that location, which seems kind of innocuous, uh, but the first uh, use that people found for this um, was, was that, was spoofing, which is uh, not recommended, not cool, against the terms of service, you shouldn't do that, uh, you'll get blocked. Uh, but it was kind of the first thing that people said, oh, I'm gonna do that because you can pretend to be playing anywhere. So you sit in your living room and then you walk without walking, which kind of you know, defeats the purpose of the game. Um, and shortly after this, uh, other developers uh, built a JavaScript library and a library in other languages that really lowered the barrier to entry to people wanting to kind of experiment with this and build stuff around it. Um, so like I said, kind of the, most, the, the first use was kind of spoofing, um, the straightforward, I'm gonna pretend I'm somewhere else. But then um, kind of the second use of this was kind of people started to build maps. Um, and I'm going to get a little bit into kind of how that worked. Um, but needless to say, uh, Niantic, the, the Pokemon developers, didn't quite like uh, people developing kind of third party stuff and looking at their code. Um, so they, would, uh, they did things like uh, they put in obfuscation after a while, which is kind of surprises, surprising that they didn't have it from the beginning. You could really just read their code. Uh, so they, they put that in, they changed SSL libraries a couple of times. Um, uh, they uh, kind of messed with the, uh, the, the headers of the, of the packets, but developers always broke through every time. Sometimes it would take days, other times it would take weeks, but uh, it, people always found a workaround uh, to continue to be able to talk to these servers and pose as a, as a client. But a few months ago, um, they adopted Facebook's uh, RackNet networking engine. Uh, it's kind of a networking engine for game programmers designed, among other things, to keep third-party um, apps uh, from, from getting creative, or as they call it, cheating. Uh, so so the, kind of that's the one that they uh, switched to. And as of this day, or last I checked, uh, none of that works. So that's all down, but kind of for the sake of learning, uh, I'm going to go over how maps worked because that's kind of the, the bit that I found interesting and kind of where uh, my app fits into all of this. So, um, yeah, so to, to build one of these maps, uh, kind of developers who built those maps, instead of um, kind of connecting with one client, so if you, connect, if you connect with one client, it gives you the, um, the Pokemon in that location. So you'll get three or four, five tops. Uh, in a certain point in the map. Um, and then if you do that often enough, your account is going to be banned because uh, the servers are going to realize that you're doing something weird. Uh, so what these servers, what these kind of systems did was they would um, spin up a server, spin up multiple accounts in there, uh, and then set each of those accounts to a different location, very close to one another, and typically in, a, in the radius of a major city. Um, so each of those accounts would return a handful of Pokemon for its own location. Uh, and when you added them all up, 
uh, it gave you all the Pokemon uh, in that city. Um, so then you, you would, all that information, you would send it to the browser uh, to render the map. And what you ended up with was a map of your city with all the Pokemon in it. Uh, and the way you did that was every one of those circles, if you can see them, um, is the, uh, the, the representation of the, the, the Pokemon found in that radius. When you add them all up, you get the whole city worth of Pokemon. So this is the type of, there were several of these. You would have one of these per major city. Um, there was one in London. And this is the type of server that my raider uh, talked to. Um, and, uh, and like we said, this raider was meant to uh, get the information about Pokemon around me and tell me if anyone, any Pokemon that I was interested in was near me or not. We'll go into detail about how that worked. Um, but just to say, when I got started with this, it felt a little bit like leeching. So I was building this thing that was going to call this other server that someone else built, and I was just going to use their information. That felt a little bit wrong. So I set out a few rules for myself, uh, which included not overwhelming these external servers, because they were built by developers who weren't, weren't making any money out of it. They were kind of volunteering and experimenting with things. So whatever I built that talked to those servers uh, had to act like a human user. I couldn't accidentally DDoS and kind of kill their server. So kind of that, that was kind of my first rule. Um, the second rule that was that whatever I built had to be free. Um, so that, that's more of a rule that I have with playing Pokemon Go myself. There's, you can spend a lot of money, and a lot of people do spend a lot of money, in playing Pokemon Go with micropayments in the app, and that's totally fine. It's just something I strictly choose not to do. Um, and uh, so whatever I built to help me catch Pokemon had to be free. So that was another constraint that I set to myself, and it led to some interesting architectural decisions later on that I will, that I will show you. And then uh, the third uh, rule that I had was that whatever I built had to be reliable. So if I was looking for a single rare Pokemon and it happened to be next to me, I wanted to know about it. It couldn't have any downtime or fail and have me miss that Pokemon that I was looking for. So it had to be reliable. And lastly, it had to be performant. That's more of a, like a selfish rule because I work in one of the fastest newspaper websites in the world and building something slow would have been, would have made me feel guilty and I don't know. So, uh, so yeah, I just, I set out to myself to build something that was decently fast. So as I started to build this, I found a willing potential user of this thing besides myself. It's my friend Lori. Um, and this turned out to be great for performance, which I didn't, I, I wouldn't have imagined because now I had, technically I had a user base. I had someone kind of using the thing that I was building. Um, so if, I, if something I did with the code made the app run a little bit slower, uh, you know, I had people using this, so I had to make it fast. So I would say, just as an aside, that finding, uh, if you're building like a, like a side project, finding at least one more person to use it uh, can be really, really great for the success of that side project that you have. And not only will it make it better, but it will probably guilt you into not quitting. I mean, or you would feel twice as guilty if you stopped doing it, because you would stop for yourself, and then this other person uh, couldn't use the thing that you were building. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of an aside. So what did this app look like? Uh, here's a bit of a screenshot of uh, the thing that I built. It's like web app. And uh, what it did is uh, you selected the, this back when we only had one or two regions out. Um, now this would have been a lot bigger, but it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so you would, you would tell it what Pokemon you want. I don't know, three, four, ten. Uh, it let you choose from any of the rare Pokemon or any Pokemon you wanted. Um, and then you would tell it what radius around you. If with that, um, uh, you could, so here is, I want, I, well, I want it to be alerted about Pokemon uh, one and a half kilometers around me. Any further, I don't care if my favorite Pokemon is out there, I'm not gonna make it. Uh, and several times I actually ran, so I, I knew how far I could run within a few minutes. So uh, 1.5 was maybe a little overdoing it. But anyway, that was my radius. Uh, and that's kind of, that's, that was my current location, so it knew where I was, and uh, I would tell it the radius, and it would, once you click save uh, or update, um, it would know where to look for these Pokemon. So, uh, and once it found a Pokemon that you were interested in, it would send you a push notification with service workers. I'll go into that a little bit. Um, and the, um, you, you, so you could either use this app uh, or alternatively, just stare at the map all day, literally looking for the Pokemon that you want. 
Uh, but having this kind of allowed me to have a life and work and uh, do everything I needed because I didn't need to look at the map all the time. So this thing just kind of did looking for me and it would just alert me when it found one. So kind of getting to the architecture of how this worked. Uh, oh, the colors aren't coming through. Okay. Imagine there's a top box there that says client, that's blue, and the Heroku box, that's purple uh, at the bottom. So uh, the way the app works, it's a, uh, it sets a cookie on your browser uh, with an ID to, uh, to know who you are for repeat visits, uh, and you tell it your location, the Pokemon that you want, uh, and the radius that you want to be uh, notified in. That gets saved to the database for every user. So there we have two users, one that's looking for Pokemon 143, and if you know your Pokemon, that's Snorlax, that was probably my user. Uh, and then another Pokemon, that, another uh, user that's looking for another three, a set of three Pokemon. Um, so once you have that in the database, there's a job that runs every 10 minutes. Um, this is in Heroku, so like a scheduled job um, that queries that external map server that we were talking about before. So uh, it does that for every user that's in the database, because every user will potentially be in a different location. So it's a different set of Pokemon that are going to come back. So you need to make one request per user. Uh, and you can probably spot um, uh, um, um, a bottleneck here. If you had a lot of users, then you would have to probably re-architect uh, some of this. But we had two users, so this worked out just fine. Um, so yeah, we, there's no scalability issues there, but yeah, the potential to, to have them. So once you make that request, uh, the response that comes back is something like that. It's an array of objects that match the Pokemon that you're looking for. So that's probably the response for my user. It says, I've found this Pokemon in these two places within the radius that you're looking for. So, um, and then, oh, let's see. So for the other user who was looking for one, four, and seven, um, the server returned that one and four are near them. So, and once that happens, we send a push notification to the, to the browser, to the client, to let the person know that, hey, we found these Pokemon in the, uh, in, in the nearby area. You tap on the, uh, on the notification, and it would open uh, Google Maps and literally walk you to the Pokemon so you could catch it. Let's see. So this worked really great for a while, uh, but since, it was, since it's location-based and it would only know your location every time you opened the app and saved, said, here's my location, uh, once you close the app, so if I did that at home, it would notify me about Pokemon around me at home. I closed the app, went to work. I often got a notification saying Snorlax nearby. I would open it up and it's nearby, but near my home, which was very frustrating. So uh, uh, my other, the other user uh, of this app, Lori, uh, he's another developer uh, who used to work at the Financial Times. Uh, he built an Android app. We both had Android phones, so that satisfied the user base. Built, built an Android app where you would input your, um, your user ID that was in the cookie in the browser. Uh, and it's what you're identified by in the database. Um, and then it would automatically, once you authorized it, it would automatically send your location every 15 minutes to the database so that if you could have the, the browser closed, the, the, the app closed, the phone in your pocket, every 15 minutes, because you allowed it to, um, it's sending your location to the database. So if it sends you a notification that a Pokemon is nearby, it'll have used your current location, which was really great. Um, and I should say that probably sending your location to a database every 15 minutes is not something that you want to do like in real life or in production or in a system that you don't know. But this was a system that we were both building uh, and we really wanted those Pokemon, so we didn't care. But yeah, just as an aside there. So uh, we had these requests going out to the uh, map server every 10 seconds. So one of the rules that, that I had was not overwhelming the external server, so that helped us you know, every 10 seconds you would send out this request, you would never kind of DDoS um, the, uh, the map server. And this worked great for a few weeks, uh, but every now and then I would get a 403 back from the server uh, instead of the JSON file that I, was, uh, that I was looking for. So the reason behind this was that we weren't really talking to the server, we were talking to the CDN sitting in front of the server. Um, and it turned out that our IP addresses in Heroku uh, we're getting uh, blacklisted sometimes because the city city is so smart. Uh, it knew that this wasn't a human being um, making the request, so it would block you. Uh, not all of them, but every now and then I would get uh, the 403, which kind of broke that um, 
that other rule that I set up for myself from the beginning. It had to be, um, it had to be reliable all the time. Um, so what we would get in this case, instead of the JSON file, uh, in the JSON object with the location for the Pokemon, we were getting a captcha to prove that we were not a robot, but we were a robot. So we had to um, kind of find a way uh, around this. So this is what the request looked like originally. A simple request uh, trying to fetch uh, that data. So what I did there was kind of trying to make it a little bit more, look a little bit more human, like it was actually sent from a browser. But CDNs are smarter than that. Uh, so I could have gone, um, gone two ways. Try to fool a CDN to make it think that these uh, requests are made from humans, uh, or simply get a whole lot more IP addresses that I could make these requests from. And uh, yeah, just getting more IP sounded uh, easier. So I went down that route. route. Um, I could have also set, set up, uh, if you've worked with Roku, uh, you will have seen that you can set up several regions for your app. So I could have set up a Europe region and a US region, for example, uh, and send requests from both. So that would have given me two pools of IP addresses. Uh, but that, and that's, that's kind of, that's how we deploy ft.com. Uh, all, of, all of ft.com is deployed in, in Heroku apps and they have two regions you know, for failover and for kind of better availability. But that seemed like a very heavyweight solution for what I was building. So I didn't do that for this. Um, let's see. Cool. So what I wanted to do was kind of figure out if I could move some of this um, code into lambdas. Uh, that would give me a whole new set of IP addresses uh, so that if one of the Heroku IP addresses got blocked, I had these ones. Um, I'll show you in a little bit how that was orchestrated. So uh, if you haven't used Lambdas before, uh, Lambdas uh, provide us with a way of running code without having to provision uh, or manage any servers. Um, they execute the code only when it's needed, um, and they scale up and down automatically. So that seemed like a good fit for what I was looking for. And uh, I remember from uh, working in FT.com uh, a year and a half ago or so uh, that my, our, my FT team and the email platform team that we have use Lambdas to send out emails. Uh, so if anyone registered to a newsletter, um, that newsletter would go out to them in an email, to them and to the other 8 million um, places it needs to go. So it would spin up Lambdas, send out all those emails, and then kind of scale down. Uh, so it sounded familiar. I gave it a go. I didn't know much about Lambdas at this time. So uh, that's kind of what reminded me of, hey, maybe Lambdas are a good idea. So um, coming back to this, if our original Heroku request failed, gives you a 403. We would try the Lambda, we would send the request from the Lambda with a different IP uh, and hopefully you know, get, a, get a successful response from there. This is the code in Heroku. We don't need to read through the whole thing, but probably the, uh, kind of the key bits here are um, we first try to fetch the Pokemon from the map server. And if the IP is banned, that function is going to swallow the 403 and just return nothing so that we can know if it returns nothing. We, need, we, we know that that went wrong and we need to go to the Lambda. Uh, so we, we fetch the same endpoint, but via the Lambda, that, that kind of other, the other route that we had. And uh, something that we did was append that emoji there, that kind of lightning rod emoji, so that when we got the notification, I don't know if you can see there, uh, you get the notification that the Pokemon's near, uh, and it would have that little lightning there uh, to let us know if the code had run in Heroku or on serverless. And this is normally something you don't expose to your users, like, hey, the code that you requested ran on this server rather than that server. Users don't care. But in this case, the users were the same people as the developers, and we really cared just to know where, where our code ran. So every time we saw the lightning on one of the notifications, we knew that our, our IP had been banned uh, in Heroku. I know, that was fun. So to set up this Lambda, I had to create an AWS account on Amazon. Uh, so you would log into the console, and uh, let's see, you select, select Lambda, and uh, let's see, uh, you give it a name, you select uh, the version of Node that you want. Uh, we have Node 8 now available. And uh, let's see, you, it's, it creates the code for you. And uh, I don't see any animation here, doing a crane neck. All right, so it creates a function for you, and it gives you kind of boilerplate code. 
you can start writing code right in there. Or if you have something bigger, or you're including libraries and, and kind of zipping, you can upload your zip file, uh, it, and it will upload it into the, um, into the Lambda function and run it. So this worked fine, but we started getting 403s from the Lambda as well, which again broke that rule of being, you know, having high availability. And just that was a bit of a head scratcher. I hoped that, you know, with the IPs from the Lambda functions, uh, I would be kind of covered. Uh, but it kind of turns out that I had set up uh, Heroku. I had set up Heroku in, in the Europe region, and I had set up the Lambdas in Europe as well. And since Heroku runs on top of AWS, I was most likely pulling from the same pool of IP addresses. So literally, I had solved nothing. I was still pulling from the same kind of pot of IPs. So I needed to get IPs from somewhere else. Um, I could have gone and created uh, Lambda functions in all those different regions manually, kind of like I did before. You kind of go in, create the Lambda, upload the zip file, and then kind of do that for several regions. But that didn't feel very manageable, especially if you need to update your code frequently. So uh, what I did was uh, use the uh, serverless framework. Um, I found this framework very uh, friendly to use, and uh, a lot of our systems at the FT uh, use it for deploying the serverless. Uh, it's, I find that it abstracts a lot of the complexity of setting up lambdas and a lot of the manual work uh, into like small configuration files. Uh, so I went with this and just tried it out. So this is this kind of replaces the going into AWS manually and doing all that stuff. This is our config file. Um, it points to we've we've created a function at the bottom called push, uh, and it points to your code, and that's it. So running this will is the equivalent of doing all that manual stuff that we saw before. And the way to run is you do serverless deploy, and optionally you tell it what region you want this code to go to. In a few seconds, your function is up and running. And if you want to deploy to more uh, regions, which is what I originally wanted to do, you can deploy to several more. This is the ones, these are the ones that I used. So you can write uh, serverless deploy and then your region in a script, like, and then just batch it up and run it. So with one click, your code is in all these regions running simultaneously. So uh, we had all these lambdas set up now. I think a little bit more than that, like five or six. And the way it would work is it's the app would try from Heroku, like we originally did. If that failed, it would try the first lambda. If that failed, it would trigger the next lambda, and so on and so forth, until it got a response that wasn't a 403, but was like some, the actual Pokemon that we were looking for. And then it would find it, it would send your push notification, which it was all I was after. I just wanted my Snorlax. That was it. Um, so very quickly, I had a setup that looked like this. Uh, I could have deployed to every other uh, AWS available region, uh, but that felt a little bit like overkill. I could have gone further and deployed to Google Cloud Services uh, because the serverless framework makes it very easy to deploy regardless of the, um, the service that's behind it. So if we see... Uh, here, we tell it that we're deploying to AWS. Uh, but you could just as easily have switched that to Google Cloud Services or several others. So you could potentially deploy this thing in a lot of places around the world. So we've mentioned performance before. And I'm not really going to talk about uh, performance in the browser, uh, but rather in the server. Uh, I'm just going to merely scratch the surface here. So uh, since this app lived in, in free Heroku Dinos, because that was my other rule, it had to be free, um, if it didn't get any traffic for half an hour, it would go to sleep, the Dino. So if the Dino was asleep and you tried to visit the page, the page would take 10 seconds to load. And that, that's just, no matter how you look at it, it's bad for performance. So yeah, 10 seconds was not acceptable. So, what I did was I created a Chrome job in my laptop that would curl the website every 25 minutes to keep it from going to sleep. So don't do this at home or like in production or anything, but it's perfectly okay as a side project. Just leave your laptop open and just keep it, you know, curling your page so that it doesn't go to sleep. And this was very effective. We no longer had those 10 second blank screens um, and so because the dinos were never sleeping. But then we had another problem. Um, Heroku, in their in kind of their basic free plan, they provide you with 550 free Dino hours every month, which amounts to about 23 days of your app running. 
So that left me with about a week at the end of the month where my app would die, which is not great for availability. You wanted this thing up all the time. So um, it means it's not reliable and I couldn't catch them all, so I had to do something about it. I had one option, which was to, uh, if I added my credit card details to Heroku, they wouldn't charge me anything, but just by just the fact that they had it, uh, they would have upped my dyno hours to 990. That would have solved the problem. But I felt that was getting really, really close to that line I didn't want to cross. If I made a mistake with my setup, it would charge my credit card and it would break the not spending money on Pokemon rule. So I didn't do that. So I had to find another solution. So what I started to think was, uh, so my app was in Heroku and I had kind of the uh, server calls on Lambdas. Could I possibly... Uh, put everything, including the, the, uh, the website, inside, inside a Lambda, so I could just break free of Heroku. Uh, so could all of this stuff, uh, and most importantly, my website, uh, live inside a Lambda? Uh, and the answer is yes. Yes, it can. Um, so this is the config file that we saw before. Uh, and you can add events to your Lambda uh, to create HTTP endpoints, much like uh, so event sources. So you could say, you know, you have a path, so slash radar, uh, and it's a method get, much like you would describe it in, uh, in Heroku using Express or, or something similar. And this is the code that that function would point to. If you've used Node and Express or something similar before, it will look very familiar. You have a, a request, you do something, and then you send back a response uh, with some text or rendering a template. So literally, you, your website can live inside of one of these Lambda functions. Um, so deciding to move, to, uh, to move my, my website from Heroku into a Lambda, in this case, was easy because it's like a toy project. Uh, but depending on the project that you have, you have to evaluate uh, how much it would cost for you because Heroku will charge you. So if you're not in a free plan, if you're kind of in the, in the, in the paid plans, Heroku will charge you by dyno hours. So if you have one dyno that's running all the time, you get charged a month's worth of, of dyno hours running. Whereas uh, AWS lambdas charge you for lambda execution. So you get one million executions, execu executions free. Uh, and then after that, you get charged uh, for each one. So if you have something like this, it's great. It's, it's, it'll be free in AWS. But if you have a website with a lot of traffic, like, like FT.com or something else, where you get more than 1 million visits, a lot more than 1 million visits, uh, then the AWS model probably becomes more expensive than having, the, um, than having it hosted in Heroku. So it's kind of a trading game that you would have to evaluate for your own, um, for your, for your own project. And it's also a bit of a barrier to entry uh, for people who are used to using Express. It's a bit of a dip change in paradigm. Uh, it's still doable, but you can have to take into account that that will happen if you, if you happen to switch from Heroku to... Uh, to serverless, to completely serverless. So to wrap up, uh, we've covered serverless function. They, we've said they're suited for small jobs that don't need uh, dedicated servers or dynos. Uh, you, can, you can even host your website in there too. Uh, and you could potentially save on running costs, uh, kind of looking at that balance that I've just talked about uh, and evaluating how much it would cost you for your particular app, for your particular kind of traffic uh, to, to be in one or the other. Uh, the serverless framework is really great. Um, you can use it to, you can use it for multiple providers uh, and your team won't need to worry about the configuration details of each of those providers. As long as they know how to set up uh, serverless, you can have anything in the background. You can switch one out and put another one in, which is really great. And um, yeah, and it's got a really, low barrier to entry. It's very quick to set up and start using without you know, worrying too much about details. And the third thing is about side projects. Uh, they're, they're a fun way to learn uh, if your time permits, because you'll probably be getting, be getting to do something that you find fun. And at the same time, you'll be learning probably about uh, something you hadn't used before or something you had used before, but you have to use in a different way because of the type of project that you're building. And lastly, you will have a higher success rate if you have at least one other person who's using the thing that you're building. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.